At the start of 2023, by many accounts, the appointment of Eddie Jones as the new Wallabies head coach was a great decision. Fans and pundits were excited all round. But that enthusiasm was short-lived, and what started as a struggle to even win a game turned into a historical disaster. Let's take a look back at the landscape of Australian rugby which led to Jones's appointment and one of the worst coaching tenures in rugby history. At the end of 2022, the Wallabies were doing just fine. On paper it may not have looked that way, with a third place finish in the Rugby Championship and only winning 5 of 14 games that year. But if we look a bit deeper, it starts to look a little bit more respectable. They lost to three of the best teams in the world, Ireland, France and New Zealand, by less than a score, with the game against New Zealand having a very controversial refereeing decision where if the referee hadn't pinged them for time wasting, they probably would have won. And they also beat South Africa in one of their games that year. However, with a loss to Italy in that November, and mounting a comeback against the Wales team that hadn't been performing consistently well for a few years now, wasn't good enough for Rugby Australia. You see, they're hosting the 2027 Rugby World Cup, and to try and get the nation behind that tournament, they felt they needed a top performance in France in 2023 to bring the Australian public on side. So head coach Dave Brenny was sacked with less than a year to go to the Rugby World Cup. But Rugby Australia didn't do this without a plan. This was a reaction to one of the best head coaches to ever coach the game, Eddie Jones being let go by England. And they snapped him up as quickly as they could. Eddie Jones had an over 80% win record at World Cups and is the only head coach to ever get to two Rugby World Cup finals, which is still true on a technicality. I mean, who would be a better option to take the Wallabies to France and continue on until the next World Cup? Was he the man who was going to save Australian rugby? You see, rugby union in Australia has been struggling. With the popularity of the NRL and the AFL, rugby union has been left to the wayside. In Super Rugby in 2023, the average attendance in Australia was just 11,403, a drop of 6,267 from 10 years ago, where it stood at 17,670, and a drop of over 14,500 in 2005, which had an average attendance of 25,909. To add further insult to injury, the average attendance in 2005 is actually higher than the highest attendance in 2023 at 25,076. But it's not only the fans abandoning the sport, it's the athletes too. With one of the biggest names in Aussie rugby, Mark Nwatanitawase, having signed for NRL side the Sydney Roosters from 2025. And many players who ply their youth rugby in union, such as Cameron Murray and Caelan Ponga, actually turn to league when they become professional due to the increased opportunity at the 16 NRL sides as opposed to the five Super Rugby sides. To add to this is the falling and respectively low investment in the grassroots game, with 4.3 million Australian dollars spent in 2019, which is around 3.5% of expense expenditure, compared to the AFL's $58 million and the NRL's $43 million. It did rise to about 7% of expenditure in 2021, which I think is around 9 million Australian dollars, so it's a marked improvement, but it's still completely dwarfed by the other sports and in real terms is less than what they were spending 20 years ago. And to cap it off, they haven't won the Rugby Championship since 2015, the Bledisloe Cup since 2002, and no franchise has won Super Rugby since 2011. It's becoming abundantly clear why Rugby Union in Australia is dying. And the 2027 World Cup is an attempt to bring them back. So they brought back the head coach who took them to the World Cup final the last time they hosted the tournament, and the last to win the Bledisloe Cup to get them back on track. But perhaps they should have looked at Eddie Jones' more recent numbers than opposed to what happened 20 years ago. Jones became the England head coach after they embarrassingly bowed out of their home World Cup in 2015 at the group stage and turned them around immediately, winning a Six Nations Grand Slam only months later in 2016 and retaining their title in 2017. They also went on a record equaling 18 game winning streak and capped it all off with a 2019 World Cup final appearance. But things started to wobble after that. They did still go on to win the 2026 Nations and also won the Autumn Nations Cup that November, but that would be the end of Eddie's success in England. They finished fifth in the 2021 Six Nations and also became the first England team to lose to Scotland at Twickenham in 38 years. They had a marginal improvement in 2022, finishing third. But after England were booed off the pitch that November against South Africa, Eddie Jones was finished as England head coach. And that's when Rugby Australia stepped in. The 2023 Rugby Championship would come around with massive intrigue to see what Eddie would do with his new side. After all, he did turn England from World Cup group stage exeters to Grand Slam champions in a matter of months. 
and turned Japan's from World Cup minnows into a team capable of beating the Springboks. Could he do the same with the Wallabies? His first game was away against the Box, and Jones would pick a young exciting team to take on a South Africa side that hadn't quite got ticking yet in this World Cup cycle. But all their gears would be in motion in Johannesburg that evening. With an embarrassing 43-12 loss in Johannesburg, the second Jones era at Australia would not start with a bang. But no big deal. It's a new team and a new coach against one of the best sides in the world. Now they have a home game against Argentina and things would get back on track, right? Well, Argentina had a few things to say about that. In a close fought battle with three tries after the 70th minute, Argentina would score late to beat the Wallabies in Australia 34 to 31 and things didn't get much better when bitter rivals the All Blacks crossed the Tasman Sea and beat them 38-7 for Australia to be whitewashed in the Rugby Championship for the first time since 2005, which funnily enough was a team also managed by Eddie Jones. But looking forward to the World Cup, they would find themselves in a pool involving three Tier 2 nations in Fiji, Portugal and Georgia, along with a Wales side who also had a returning head coach and had been what can only really be described as utter dross in that year's Six Nations. All things were looking dandy for Australia to get to a World Cup quarterfinal. And even some idiots on the internet making preview videos were saying they'd finish top of their group. But then, disaster would strike. Fiji would win the Pacific Nations Cup, beating Japan 35-12 along the way. And then on the 26th of August, they would turn up to Twickenham and beat England for the first time in their history, 30-22. All of a sudden, the pressure was on in Pool C for Australia. Eddie Jones had also named a rather controversial squad, going for youth over experience in some areas dropping longtime servants to the Wallabies like Quade Cooper and opting for younger players like Carter Gordon, along with naming uncapped 18-year-old fullback Max Jorgensen. With losses to New Zealand and France in the lead-up to the World Cup, they would kick it off against Georgia, with some even quietly whispering about a Georgian win. But Australia would hold strong and comfortably get their first win under Eddie Jones and beat Georgia 35-15, but the big match against Fiji would come next. Now, some context on Fiji. Fiji is a small Pacific Island nation that started playing rugby when it was brought over by the British in the 19th century and was originally played between British and native Fijian service members but was shortly after racially segregated. But nonetheless, a love for the sport was sprouted where they pride themselves on playing some of the most free-flowing and attractive rugby. But Fiji has always suffered from a lack of professionalism and money on the islands. They've had some of the best players in the world playing around the globe but have historically struggled to bring it together on the national stage. That was until two things happened. The addition of Vern Cotter as head coach, and later Simon Rai Wului, and the admission of the Fiji Jura to Super Rugby. Cotter left at the end of 2022 and was replaced by Simon Rai Wului, but Cotter brought what he brings everywhere he goes, a strong emphasis on set piece and defence, which Rai Wului, who was involved in the Jura already, was able to build off of in the lead up. To this World Cup. Like turning their mall into something that was fine under Cotter into an absolutely destructive weapon. And the Drua allowed them to have a core set of players who played in Fiji and were familiar with each other which made it easier for them to bond together. But Fiji somewhat controversially lost their opening game to Wales after dropping the ball over the line three times and some suggesting they had a penalty try not given. Any of those would have been enough for them to win the game. Fiji were hungry, angry and had Australia in their sights. Having not beaten Australia in over 60 years, and with the two sides results going into the game, some Australians were confident that they should have enough to get over the line. But Fiji had other ideas. And in the most un-Fiji-like way ever, they would win the game 22-15, mainly by a fantastic kicking display from scrum half Simeone Curivoli. Having not beaten a Tier 1 nation under Eddie Jones, and losing to unclassified as Tier 2, even though they probably shouldn't be, things couldn't get any worse against Wales, right? Well, due to Wales beating Fiji in the opening game, an Australia win could see them backdoor their way into a quarterfinal. And with Wales' form going into the World Cup, it wasn't entirely out of the question. Wales finished fourth in the Six Nations, which involved a record defeat to the Scots at Murrayfield. And with their narrow victory in round one, and a somewhat unconvincing performance against Portugal, some Australians were allowing themselves to hope. And as a Scotland fan, I have the relevant experience to let you know that having hope is about as good an idea as betting on Ireland to win a World Cup quarterfinal. And only three minutes into the game, Wales would take a lead with a try. But it would be off the boot of Gareth Anscombe where most of the damage would come. And Australia found themselves 16-6 to down at half time. But in the opening 12 minutes of the second half, Wales would score 13 unanswered points to boot them out of sight 
of the Wallabies. In fact, Wales wouldn't concede any more points in the whole match. And when the final whistle blew, Wales had booked 40 points on the Wallabies, who hadn't extended their score beyond the six they had in the 14th minute. Australia's World Cup was all but over. Their only chance left was for Portugal to beat Fiji. That was never going to happen. Was it? Well, I'm sure as we all know now, Portugal did beat Fiji to get their first ever World Cup win through a late try by Rodrigo Marta, which was successfully converted by Samuel Marquez. But unfortunately for Australia, and fortunately for Fiji, their losing bonus point they acquired in their 23 to 24 loss to Oslobos was enough to see Fiji through and saw Australia crash out of the Rugby World Cup for the first time at the pool stages. In the aftermath of the World Cup, with seven losses and only two wins to Eddie's name, he resigned from his post at Aussie Rugby on the 1st of November to join Japan six weeks later, leaving Rugby Australia clueless on who can take the reins for the next four years leading up to their home World Cup. With the British and Irish Lions tour in a couple of years, and a Women's and Men's World Cup not long after, can the new Rugby Australia CEO, Phil Woe, find a way to get the Wallabies back to the team that won two World Cups in the 90s, which you can learn all about by watching this video right here about the entire history of the Rugby World Cup. Thanks for watching.